All right. Good morning, everybody, and we welcome in everybody in Tennessee and everybody in Kansas City and Lakeside, everybody. Come on, our online church family as well, and Mike Spears in the Knoxville baseball team, all watching in Knoxville, Tennessee. Come on. Glad you guys are here. Hey, if you need notes, raise your hand. I want to make sure you have notes. We've got a lot to go over and in a quick, kind of short amount of time that we have together. Um, listen, welcome to the end of the world. <laughs> series. <laughs> the pause is important. <laughs> welcome to the end of the world series. We're going to be talking about what does the Bible actually say about this whole end of the world thing. And we're going to look at that from Scripture. So we're calling it Apocalyptic Awakening, the End Times Unveiled, because so many people think it's a big mystery. Like, what is going to happen? What is a, the Bible lays it out for us, tells us very clearly what is to come and what is to happen and how it is to happen. And so I'm going to lay that out for you scripturally, okay, what the Bible actually says. And there's been volumes of books written about it, reams of articles, movies, all those things have come out. It's talked about so often. Hollywood consistently puts out a movie or a TV series or something that concerns an, uh, an apocalyptic theme, an end-of-the-world kind of theme. And the reason that is is because it sells. <laughs> it absolutely sells. People are interested in it. But the important thing is not what Hollywood creates or what we even think in our minds. The important thing is, what does the Word of God say? And, and what did Jesus say about it? And so I'm going to start in Matthew 24, and I want us to stand in honor of the Word of God, and as we always do, in Matthew 24, I'm going to read a section of it. In, in the beginning of that section, it says that Jesus foretells the future. That's such an important statement. He tells us what is coming, and I, and I love that. And so I'm going to begin in verse 4. He says, Jesus told them, don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah. We certainly have seen that many, many times. They will deceive many. And you, you will hear of wars, threats of wars, but don't panic. Remember, this whole series is going to give you so much confidence as a Christian. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation. And kingdom against kingdom. Have you noticed more and more countries going to war against each other? It's incredible how much that is increasing, especially with weak leadership in Washington, D.C. That's not right here, but that's here. <laughs> there will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. But all of this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. Then you're going to be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You'll be hated all over the world because you are my followers. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere. Seeing that? And the love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it. And then the end will come. The reading of the Word of God. You may be seated. Lord, thank you so much for your Word. And as we learn, and we know the end times is a, a subject that is so important that you have laid it out in Scripture for us to understand. And as we learn today, may it go beyond just knowledge. That's where it starts. We want to learn about this. But help it to really play out in how we live our life from this day forward. That it would impact us in such a way that things that we know we need to change would change because of what's coming. And we're thankful for you for warning us and telling us and encouraging us with these words. We give you the praise in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. So as we look at this, there's a lot of crazy things that have been done in the name of the end of the world whether it's purchasing extra AR-15s, shotguns, large quantities of non-perishable foods, 
uh, military-style bunkers that are installed in our yards, shortwave radio purchases, and that's just at our lakeside campus. <laughs> and so if you think about it, like, there's a lot of things happening. Uh, it's always good to be prepared for the next crazy disaster that comes along, but God has given us this playbook of how it's all going to go down. The Word of God is very, very clear on this process towards the end, which for believers ushers in the beginning. So it's an exciting thing. As, it's, as it can be scary, as you talk about it and you learn about it, the reality is for believers, man, we've been waiting for this. We've been looking forward to this. This has been the hope that we absolutely look forward to. Today, I'm going to be focusing on the rapture, the rapture of the church and what that means and what that actually looks like and how that's going to occur and even when that's going to occur. But real quick, an overview from the message I did back in July, because this end of the world series was the number one requested series when we did the you asked for it questionnaire. I gave you an overview back in July. So that's the broad stroke picture of the end of the world. It's important that you have that as a foundation because each one of these messages builds on the next. I'm going to take you through in sequence of how these events occur so that you have a framework in your mind of how that is actually happening. And so as Jesus said, so you won't be surprised by this, that you can actually be encouraged about what is coming. So just Broad stroke overview by way of review, I talked to you about the fact that the Bible talks about the end of the world specifically over 329 times. One out of every 30 verses refers to the end of the world. 23 out of 27 New Testament books talk specifically about the end of the world. It is all throughout Scripture. It's not just a New Testament thing. It's Old Testament, New Testament. It's all throughout the Word of God. And in Matthew 24, Jesus mentions a couple things to watch out for, which is why, again, we're calling it this idea of an apocalyptic awakening, because Christians have to wake up. We have to wake up in our world to see what is going on in our world to actually realize this is all planned. This is all happening the way it's been scripted. It's all happening the way God predicted and the way the prophecies of the Bible line up, that people would grow cold, that they would start going their own way, that they would ignore God, even though he has what's best for us. So he said, you're going to see deceivers. And then he said, you're going to see an increase in wars and natu uh, natural disasters. And then he said, you're going to watch out for an increase in anger towards Christians. Now, that's not just the anger towards us as people who follow Christ, which he mentions is going to happen, but it's all things Christian. Anything that has to do with the Bible. You see now, if you say Bible on TikTok, you're banned. Bible. Banned. Country music star came out and he, his song is because mama had a Bible and daddy had a truck. And he got banned on TikTok for that line. I'm banned on X right now. I don't, I, we still don't know why. I'm banned on all... Now, you're going to get banned. There's so many things that are coming against Christians, and Jesus says, don't be surprised by that. You look in our public school system, the doctrines that they're teaching. It's the antithesis of what the Bible teaches. And the Bible tells us they will call good evil and evil good. So we should not be surprised about that. And he told us that. So what I'm going to do over the course of the series, I'm going to walk you through a timeline of events. This is not a detailed timeline, but I want you to see this timeline so that you understand where we're going with this. First of all, we have ages past. Everything leading to the cross, to the birth, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is ages past. So that's all in the past. Jesus comes, dies for our sins on the cross, and then we usher in the church age. That's what we're in right now, which is known as the church age. Then we're going to be raptured. We'll talk about that today. We go to the rapture of believers, which ushers in the seven-year tribulation time, which is divided three and a half years and three and a half years. The first three and a half years are not so bad. They're not good, but compared to the last three and a half years, this part is known as the great tribulation. And then we have, which I didn't put on here, as I mentioned, this is not a 
um, detailed timeline, but you have Armageddon, and we'll talk about that. And that goes right there. Armageddon. Um, I don't know. I just, you know. And so we have that, and then we're going to have the millennium. I'll talk about the 1,000 year reign of Christ. And then we have the judgment of all unbelievers, which ushers in eternity. So that gives you a general overview of where we're headed in this series. And we're going to take time. It gets pretty heavy in there, but you're going to understand it, okay? Because we're not going like crazy. We're not doing weird stuff, okay? I want you to know that this series, there can be scary elements to it. So what I would say is if you have kids that, you know, you, you decide whether they should be in it or not in this, in this certain messages because um, we do have a child care and we do have children's ministry for them because it's something that I want to make sure I give you that heads up. We're not going to be, you know, gory stuff, but I'm going to be pretty descriptive on some of the stuff that the Lord talks about. And so you'll have to make that decision. But as a Christian, you're going to be very encouraged because the Bible tells us how the end comes. And I, I've told you this before, but I love to uh, record the games, like Padres or like yesterday, the Fighting Irish, which I was watching all the way towards the end when it looked like Duke was going to beat us. And it was not fun, and I had to turn it off. And then I got the notification that we won in the last second. And so what's awesome about that is now I'm going to go back and I watch the highlights. Because I already know we won. And it's so encouraging. It's like the Padres. You know, I get the notification, Padres won. All of a sudden, September, they woke up. And it's like, here we go, we're going to start playing baseball. Anyway, and so I, I look at that, and I'm like, I'm going to watch that game now. Because I don't want to spend, you know, Two and a half, three hours on a losing game. But when you know the winning score and your team wins, you get confidence when you're watching the game. You know they, they score some runs. Take the Padres. They score some runs. The other team scores. They have a big inning, whatever. But I already know the end. So I can keep watching. I already know what's coming. It's the same thing when we talk about the end of the world. Sometimes it looks like the enemy's scoring some runs, right? Sometimes it looks like evil is winning. How can they pass these laws? How can this happen? And we get so discouraged because it just looks like the enemy is winning. They, they may win an inning or two or three, but they don't win the game. We know how this ends. We win. The end of it all, Christians, those who follow Jesus Christ, win. We already know the score. That's so encouraging when we look at this. It's a powerful thing to understand. Now understand this. Whenever a church or a pastor starts talking about the end times, it tends to bring out the wackos. People will actually go from church to church looking for an end times series. There's great fascination in end times prophecies. And so wackos will come out. And so here's what you need to know if you're a wacko. <laughs> if you're here to learn, great, learn. Okay, but this isn't sensationalism. We're not going with weird stuff. We're not going to be talking nonsense. We're talking straight out of the Word of God, what Jesus says, what the Bible says, how this all lines up. And if you decide to be a wacko, then let, let me just tell you this. I have some pastor friends who I can introduce you to. There are other churches, and I'll introduce you to them. But this is not going to be a wacko-centered thing where you're going to start getting crazy and all that, okay? So that's just a little heads up because that is the stuff that throws people off all the time. I, I get stories. I've already got stories from the first service where people are talking about, man, I've been to a church, and they started talking about end times, and all this crazy stuff started happening. I said, yeah, that's not us. And so that's not who we are, because that's not what the Bible says. <laughs> if we want more clicks, we'll get crazy. But we don't care about that. I, I want to give you the truth of the Word of God, of what it says, so that you can have the confidence that you're supposed to have. And let me just say this. I know people have their opinions on the end times. And some people make things up in their own mind of how they hope it'll go. And I'm just going to give you this, not so that you can, you know, I can pat myself on the back or you can go, woohoo, 
Ooh, wow, it'll be great for you. But you need to understand, I spent four years in a Bible college learning the Word of God expositionally. I went on and I did two more years in a master's degree in theology and biblical exposition. Two more years. Then I did five years in another program that was more intense called a Master of Divinity. That's five more years. And then I went ahead and did another five years in a doctoral program. That's 16 years of formal training and understanding eschatology, soteriology, theology, and all the other ologies. And the reason is so that I could present it in such a way that it makes sense because I have to understand it. And so I kept learning and I kept growing and I kept trying to understand so that when I present, it's clear from the Word. Not my own words, but from the Word. And some people love to get into this, a series like this and then send me YouTube stuff. People on YouTube, well, this guy says it's this. I don't care. He hasn't been through what I've been through. He hasn't dug in like I've dug in. I tell you that because I think of it in terms of if I'm going to have surgery, I don't want a dude who's on YouTube. Or a lady on YouTube going, I know how to cut that out of you. I want someone who's done the residency, who's done the education, who's been there, who gets it, who truly understands what it's like to cut something out of somebody's body. That's what I'm telling you as a heads up as we go through this. I don't want your emails. I don't want your direct messages on social media showing me some charlatan who you believe in. I love you, though. But I'm going to give you the truth right out of the Word of God. We don't believe in sensationalism. There's a difference between isogesis and exegesis. Isogesis is a way to study the Bible that takes your thoughts and your opinions and your YouTube videos and everything you've seen online and you put it into Scripture. And you decide this is what it says based off of my feelings and based off of my understanding. That's the wrong way to interpret Scripture. We interpret Scripture through exegesis. Exo means taking out what the Bible says and helping apply it to people's lives. Not opinions, what the Bible says. When we understand the rapture and the end of the world, we can be prepared, not scared. So let's take a look at what the rapture is. Let's take a look at why the rapture and when the rapture. Number one, the rapture is instantaneous. Instantaneous. Matter of fact, in Matthew, and I didn't put this in your notes, but Matthew 24, 42, it says, so, no, wait, 40. It says, two men will be working together in the field. One will be taken, the other will be left. Two women will be grinding flour at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. And it goes on. The idea is the rapture happens instantaneously. One believer taken, non-believer left. It's instantaneous. Millions of conversations will end mid-sentence. Maybe a co-worker, maybe a husband and a wife, if there's a believer and a non-believer in the house. Mid-sentence, person's gone. They're like, what? Think about this. Air travel during the rapture. 151,000 flights every day worldwide. I'm talking about commercial flights. That didn't, this doesn't even count private jets and all that other stuff. I'm talking about commercial flights. There's 151,000. On average, there's 150 people on those commercial jets. That's a low average. So if just one-third of the pilots are both, because there's always a co-pilot on a commercial jet in case someone gets incapacitated. So if, if just one-third of all commercial airlines has two pilots that are Christian, which is a very, very much could be very common, with just one-third, that's 50,000 crashes commercially when the rapture happens. That's 7.5 million people dead just through air traffic travel in a moment. Not to mention the people on the ground. When the Bible says chaos and pandemonium will ensue after the rapture, this is one of the reasons. That doesn't even count all the vehicles that are driving with Christians in them that all of a sudden just whoop. Right? And I mean, you think about the freeways. 
I mean, there's not a lot of Christians driving on the 94 out here, but there's <laughs> probably few of us. But all the different wrecks and all the different things that will be happening because Christians are out of here. We're gone. And, and when that happens, it ushers in the seven-year hell on earth known as the tribulation. We'll talk about that next week. But 1 Corinthians 15 says it like this. I'm telling you a mystery. Not all of us will die, but we will all be changed. And it will happen in an instant, in a split second, at the sound of the last trumpet. It goes like this. It just happens. Sometimes people will say, is that going to be painful? Like, are we going to be like, no. Number two, I want you to write down. It's absolutely painless. If the rapture happens while we are alive on earth, we won't feel it. We'll be instantly transformed and we'll be instantly transported. Just like Enoch, just like Elijah, just like that, they went from this life to the next in an instant. Look what it says. Why? 1 Corinthians 15, 53 says, This body that decays must be changed into a body that cannot decay. We get new bodies. That will go on forever. This mortal body must be changed into a body that will live forever. So if we're here when the rapture happens, boom, instantly we're taken up. And here's the third thing I want you to write down. The rapture is anticipated. It's anticipated. Generation after generation of Christians have anticipated the rapture. As a matter of fact, the rapture which ushers in eternity for believers is something that we innately know. It's not something that should be feared at all. It should be anticipated and with excitement, and it always has been anticipated, generation after generation. That's when you see things like Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Like, please, we want you to come. Take us. That's what it's referring to. It's really referring to the rapture, because the second coming isn't until Armageddon, but he'll take us if we're here while he decides this whole thing ends. There is preoccupation, even if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ. There's preoccupation with the end of the world. That's why there's movies all the time. The Walking Dead was a series that many of you know because over 22 million people would tune in and watch that thing. It's one of the highest rated series of all time in terms of viewership. And it's an apocalyptic theme. It's an end of the world theme. People are fascinated with end of the world scenarios. And people wonder, is that how it's going to be? We're going to have zombies and non-believers are wondering, like, what is it? What is it going to look like? And all that. Why? Why are we so curious? Because of Ecclesiastes, what God says, he has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. He's put it in our hearts. Even if you don't believe in Jesus, you know this isn't all there is. You still know that 100 out of 100 people still die. You know that. And in your heart, you're going, well, there's got to be something else. And we continue to hear stories of people that are just coming to church. They're just starting. You heard one last week of looking around at our culture and looking around at our world and going, there's definitely evil and there's definitely good. (laughs) They're seeing it. And they're starting to make a decision for the good, for Christ. You know, when you look at that, you can absolutely be excited about it, prepared for it. I think of it as my 102-year-old grandma who went to be with the Lord a couple weeks ago as she was about to face him and be with him. She said, if this is dying, this is fun. (laughs) She she looked forward to it. She prepared for it. She lived her life for him. See, the rapture is this instantaneous, it ushers us into eternity without experiencing death ourselves. And God could come at any time and get us. All the prophecies have been fulfilled leading up to this point. It literally can happen at any moment. And we look forward to that moment. Matter of fact, 1 Thessalonians 4 says it like this. We will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. So encourage each other with these words. It's not to scare us, it's to prepare us. Like in any moment, you could be caught up. And that word is an important word, caught up. It literally in the Greek. And I love when we talk about the Greek because, you know, it's not not something that is is, uh, sensational. 
when you get down to the Greek, sometimes translators will make some words a little more sensational than others, and you're going, that's not exactly accurate. But this one here is arpa gay, arpa gay somena. Arpa gay somena. Now, why is that important? Because that literally means to be snatched away, snatched away in an instant. And that's when we see this, when he talks about being caught up, that's the word. Arpa, gay, somena. And it's such an important word to know that in an instant we'd be caught up with the Lord in the air, just like that. And that's what we look forward to. So the question really becomes, are you rapture ready? Are you ready for the rapture? We want to make sure we are absolutely prepared. But here's the rapture's purpose. Why the rapture? Here it is in a nutshell. Number one is to spare Christians from the tribulation. That's the first and foremost. To spare Christians from the tribulation. As I said earlier, the tribulation is a hellish time on the planet. And it is God's plan to take us out before that condemnation starts to happen here on the earth. Some of the things that will be happening during the tribulation we'll talk about next week, but one of them is the idea of the mark of the beast. Now, we couldn't even imagine a time where a government would say, hey, you have to have this mark before you can work. You have to have this mark before you can go to a store. You have to have this mark until you can be in a gathering of X amount of people. We would have never imagined. As a matter of fact, people scoffed at this idea of the number of the beast. They scoffed at it for decades. Nobody would ever take an injection with a number in it. They're not going to force us to do that until COVID. And guess what happened in COVID? As you all know, so many people were forced. If they wanted to keep working, they needed to get vaccinated. If they wanted to, keep, uh, if they wanted to go to a gathering of X amount of people, they had to have a vaccination card. They even suggested ways that that could be implanted in the skin so that you don't have to carry a card with you. Folks, don't, don't, don't be asleep at the wheel here. That is social conditioning for what's coming. I don't know when it's going to come, but at some point, people on this earth, and I think it's during the tribulation, I think we'll be gone, Christians will be gone, raptured, but people will have to have that number or that chip in order to, A, work, you want to work where you can get money, where you can get food, or to go to the grocery store to get food, you'll have to have a number. <laughs> Isn't it interesting? The Bible already talks about that. It's coming. We know that. And we would have never imagined. But that's social conditioning. That's a precursor to the end of the world. It's a precursor to what is going to happen. But because of the rapture of believers, we don't have to go through that hellish time. 1 Corinthians 15, 50, uh, 51 and 52 says it like this. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We won't all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment in the blink of an eye. So just like that, rapture ready, there we go. Number two, the purpose of the rapture is to lead non-Christians to Jesus. Those that remain after Christians are gone. Revelation 7, 9 through 16 talks about this specifically. But very simply, folks, this is going to be the largest harvest of souls in the history of the world. Why? Well, several reasons. One, people are going to be going, some will be like, oh, those Christians, they were right, <laughs> and they're gone. And it'll cause people to fall to their knees and be like, please, God. People with family members who don't believe, and all of a sudden their family members are gone, are going to be going, wait a minute, where's that Bible that he kept talking about? Now, some hearts will be hardened because of it. There will be conspiracy theories galore of why all the Christians are gone. Probably number one will be they were abducted by aliens. Have you seen all the talk about aliens now? It's coming, man, more and more. More and more of this stuff. Well, it's going to be a way that people that are left behind can cope. Oh, the aliens got them. Those were the ones, you know. But it's going to be a time of the biggest harvest of souls. And death and pain and destruction will be rampant. Evil will be rampant. Sometimes people say, well, will any believers have to go through, you know, the tribulation? The answer to that is yes. Those who accept Christ during the tribulation, they will go through it. Because they're in it. They're already in it. Um, and the Bible talks about that in Revelation. It says that. It says this, these are they 
who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So during the tribulation, as I mentioned, there will be a tremendous, tremendous harvest of souls. People will actually wake up. But others, the Bible describes, will turn against God even more and curse God. Now, when will this occur? When will the rapture, get your pens out, get ready, I'm going to give you the date. (laughs) You remember, if I do, you know your instructions. Get out. I've lost it. All right, but here's the reality. There will be no warning. Number one, it's going to occur, but there'll be no warning of it. It'll just happen instantaneously, as I mentioned. It's an instantaneous act of God moving us from this life to the next. And Jesus said it. Look what he says. He said, look, I'm going to come as unexpectedly as a thief. Blessed are all who are watching for me. It's apocalyptic awakening. Let's stay awake. Watch for him. Be ready. Be ready. And then secondly, the rapture will take place before the tribulation. Before the tribulation. We're gone. We don't have to go through the tribulation. Now, understand. This is what I'm talking about. When I I talk about my studies and everything else going on as far as unpacking a pre-trib, pre-tribulational rapture view. There are multiple views. Some people believe that believers have to go through half of the tribulation. First three and a half years are bad, but they're nowhere near as bad as the second half, three and a half. It's split up in three and a half, three and a half. And some believe that you'll be raptured mid-tribulational, It's called the mid-trib view. Others believe you have to go through the entire tribulation of seven years as a believer. Then you're raptured at the end of the tribulation. Those are people that are like Raider fans and masochists, and they love (laughs) to think, no. There there are people, though, that believe that. And here's the thing. You can be a Christian. You can believe in mid-trib. You can be a Christian and believe in post-trib. As I mentioned, with all my studies and the scholars that have studied this even longer than I have, most see that it's clear that it's a pre-tribulational rapture view. However, others believe mid and some believe post. And, you know, when I was in Bible college, we got in fights over this. Bible college was brutal, y'all. We had Bible brawls, (laughs) scripture scrums. It wasn't easy. We had our pre-trib table where we ate, and we had post-trib people over there, and mid-tribbers in the middle, and it was like, man, don't make me get revelation out. Like, we would just back and forth, and it would be like puffing up, and don't think it was easy, you guys, in Bible college, man. There was a lot of Bible bullying, so, but I got through it. I got through it, all right? But here's the thing. When you look at the tribulation, and you think about this whole idea of The tribulation being about condemnation. Condemnation. The condemnation of God. It's very clear that that's what the tribulation is about. Here's just two verses of the many that speak against why Christians will not. They will not go through it. Romans 5, 9, And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, He will certainly save us from God's condemnation. That's just one verse you can hold on to. Here's the next one. So now there is some condemnation for those who, what is it? There is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. So either the work of the Lord Jesus Christ is complete or it's not. Either I believe that his work is sufficient for my salvation or it's not. When he was on the cross and he was about to give up his spirit, do you remember the words he said? He said, it is is almost, not quite, through the tribulation, then finished. Remember when he said that on the cross? He said, no, it is what? Finished. It is finished. That means his work is complete. It's complete. And when I trust in that, there is now, therefore, no condemnation. Not some, none. It is finished. He paid for it all. And then to add something to salvation, like going through the tribulation, is wrong. It's absolute heresy if you look scripturally. That's from my opinion. Now, again, you can be a Christian and still go and still, you know, believe that. And if you argue argue with me about that, I'll just ask God to make sure you do go through the tribulation. 
I think that's fair. You love it so much, why don't you go through it? Okay, now here's why we can have confidence, though, in the rapture. One is that the tribulation is really about, as I mentioned, God's wrath. It's about his wrath. And you look throughout the pattern of Scripture, and we see God removing believers before he condemns an area. Let's just take Genesis 18, and let's take Abraham, for example. Abraham, he basically bargains with God. God, will you ruin, will you destroy Sodom and Gomorrah if there's 50 righteous people there? And God says, no, I won't, not for 50. And then he goes through the whole thing, right? He's bargaining, 40, 30? Oh, please, God, don't be mad at me. But what about 10? No, I won't. If there's 10 righteous people, I will not condemn it. We see his pattern all throughout Scripture. Rahab and the spies with Jericho. He could have obliterated it with Rahab, the believer, in it. But he said, no, let's get her and her family out. He does this. He snatches away before he condemns an area, a country. So it's God's wrath. We see that in verses in Revelation 6 through 18. In Revelation 16, 1 says, Then I heard a mighty voice from the temple say to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out on the earth the seven bowls containing God's wrath. We'll talk more about that, but that's part of the description of what happens during the tribulation. Now, the book of Revelation talks a lot about the end times. It confuses a lot of people. There's a lot of symbolic language. But here's the thing I want you to understand. It's actually very easy. The first three chapters mention the church 19 times. 19 times. Okay, listen to me. Chapters 6 through 18, which in detail describes the tribulation, the church is never mentioned. Never mentioned. So that's the next thing I want you to write down. There's a very important missing word from the book of Revelation, chapter 6 through 18, and that's the church. That's you as a believer in Christ and me. And the reason is, we're out of here. <laughs> we don't go through the Revelation. And Revelation 3.10 says it like this, Since you've kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. That word church is gone because we've done the Enoch and Elijah thing. God has removed us. He's taken us from this life to the next. And that gives us confidence. That gives us confidence to live today. This event that I'm describing known as the tribulation, as I mentioned, is a hellish time on the planet. You multiply all the wars, all the disease, all the destruction. In our lifetime and even in the world history, and it is nothing compared to those seven years here on this planet. We'll talk about that next week. And I want you to understand, you may not understand all of this from message to message, but by the end of this, we'll put it all together and tie a bow on it and you'll understand it. Just don't miss a single week. <laughs> Just don't miss a single week, all right? Jesus said you'll be able to discern the time and that you'll be able to check some things out and see these signs that point to the end. And you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And he did that to prepare us, not to scare us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, that you did give us your word and that you promised us. We can have confidence as believers. And so we thank you for that. If you're here and you're not a believer, if you can hear my voice and you're not a believer... Listen, you, you don't want to roll the dice here. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to prepare you. You need to know. You may not know all about this whole Jesus and Christian thing, but you need a relationship with Jesus Christ. Start there. I didn't know hardly anything when I said yes to Christ. But he'll guide you and he'll direct you. He'll tell you what he wants you to know. He'll help you live for him. Say that in your heart. Just say, Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner. I need you. I believe you died for me on the cross. You paid for all my sins. Truly, it is finished. And today, I'm choosing to follow you. If you said that, welcome to the family. Let us know that on your connection card, online or in the seat back in front of you. Others of you, it's time to recommit your life to Christ. You would say, you know, I was closer to God at one time. I'm a Christian, but I've drifted. Just say that in your heart. He can hear you. Say, dear Jesus, today I'm recommitting my life to you. God, thank you for those that said yes to you. Thank you for those that are recommitting to you. And we look forward to today. You rapture us out of here. But until then, we got work to do. 
and saving more souls for you. We love you. We praise you. And it's in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Put your hands together for the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Please stand as I read the benediction from Ephesians. It says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how high, how wide, how long, and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And all God's children said, amen. Love you guys. We'll see you next week. God bless you.